Hey, what's up, everyone? This is episode 12 of the Maury Miles podcast. Really excited about this one. We have Trayvon Rommel, a excellent, amazing guest to be able to have on to the podcast. We were able to talk about some great things. We talked about track. We also talked a lot about the spiritual side of things and things that he really is passionate about outside of track. It was an awesome conversation. Got into how also to build track and field into the future. Really pleasure to have him on. I was a little bit nervous, especially starting out. You could probably tell with the questions and really just how I'm talking in general. But overall, great podcast. Awesome to be able to have him on. Hope you guys enjoy. If you do, like, subscribe, all that type of good stuff. We'll hop into it. Enjoy. We have Trayvon Bromel here, one of the fastest people in the world, indoor champion, NCAA champion, NCAA indoor champion, under 20 champion, national champion, world indoor champion, two times world champion medalist, looking to become, I'm assume, assuming, you know, world champion one of these days and, and, you know, in the near future. So appreciate you having, or you coming on here. Uh, I think that it's going to be a really, really fun time. So just to get started, just to give a little bit more for the background, I always think it's great to be able to hear, you know, how you came up and did track. Was that mean, was track something that you chose? Did it choose you? You know, I guess a little bit more story into, you know, what started you first into the journey of deciding you wanted to be a, a, a track and field athlete? I felt the speed was God given. I don't really feel like I chose sport. I think it just found me. I've been running since I was, I was telling this at practice. I've been running since I was four years old. I started competing when I was six. Yeah, and it, it just came from what most people deal with coming up yeah, in the neighborhood is just racing your friends and just getting that experience of competition at an early age. And once I got introduced to my late coach, Garland Boyd, it was just pretty much a uphill battle from competition to competition to, you know, where I am now. Yeah. And as you were continuing up through when you first started, I'm assuming you were you were naturally pretty fast, naturally one of the, the faster kids in the area. But, you know, as you journeyed through all that, I mean, how much improvement do you felt do you feel came from the consistency of of working out and the, you know, building up the power and, and, and what were I, I guess some important things that that you took away from those early years of uh, competing within track. Oh uh, man, it, it it was a battle because I've always been the athlete that I feel like work hard and, and a lot harder than people in my age group. When I was probably like eight years old, I was training with the twelve and thirteen year olds. When I got to that same young teenage age group bracket, I was tra- I was probably like thirteen training with the seventeen eighteen year olds. So I've always been a hard worker. Uh, it's a blessing and a curse that we see people who are exceptional at a young age, and then when they get to the senior level, it kind of die away. They're pretty much burned out. But I've always kept that mindset of training with people that was better than me to become better, and I feel like it, it's worked. It's worked pretty well. Yeah, so yeah, the work ethic has always been important to to me. So I I never get overwhelmed or dismayed by saying if I'm training with somebody who's just as good as me or if somebody in a certain particular aspect of training is better than me, I look at it as a boost for myself. So for me, I've always, it's, it's always been a work ethic. Yeah, I love that. And, and where did that, where you feel it came from? I mean, I, I know I read a little bit about how single mom had a lot of brothers, you know, obviously there's probably part of your work ethic came up from that, but I feel there's also a lot of people that are in that situation that don't have the same type of work ethic as you. So, you know, what really kind of brought that out or made it so you were able to you know want to step up and want to be somebody that was pushing themselves in that way you always want better for yourself man i I don't think a lot of people think like that when they're that young for me i've seen so much just pain out of my childhood and i always knew i wanted better you know it's i I had more brown sad days than happy when i was young so for me it was i always wanted better i always wanted better for me my mom and family members and stuff so i always knew i wanted to do something to be able to kind of change the aspect of our lives that's awesome and do you look back at all and and say that the i guess the the training and, and some of the things that you know, happened in the, the early years where we almost preparation for, I guess, what started to, to occur later on in, in the, in your career within basically from that 2016 to 2020 time period. Well, I mean, during those time periods, I was out of sport from injury, but I felt yeah. it definitely set me up to have a promising future. If the injuries never happened, I feel obviously I was on the way to being, uh, enduring some of the greatest things as shoot, being a teenager running nine, eight, you already see that, you know, I shoot, 
I don't know too many 19 year olds that ran nine. So ever, I don't think it's ever been done. Yeah. So it's like everything, you know, preparation, everything before was setting things up to be, but you know, you can't control things that you can't control. So it's just one of those things that you got to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And that's, you know, going into the, the faith and, and, and the spiritual side, I'm, I'm somebody that, that grew up Catholic and, you know, I, I know that in different parts of my life where it, it seems it's tough and, and, you know, it, it's uncomfortable. I feel like it has a plan in ways where, you know, you know that the, and just having that belief, you, you know, that these are going to end up being bad problems or things that will get us prepared for a future where now we're going to be able to set ourselves up for success and be able to, you know, take the higher road. Right. And I know we talked a little bit about this, but, you know, that leads into the whole, you know, after the and I think this is right where when it happens. Right. Was, was the 2016 in the Olympic, you know, and, and talking about or you, you ended up hurting the the heel and having to get the surgery ended up having, you know, just not a good set of experiences there. But the, the big thing that I read that I think was something that can connect to people is just, you know, talking about the taking the L after L after L and just being in this what seemingly downward spiral. And even your coach alluded to, I thought I was going to talk to Trevon. He was going to say that, you know, I'm going to quit. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore just because a lot of things. So, you know, for people that are looking or, or have that, you know, happening within their lives, they just feel everything's downward and, and thinking about quitting do you have any words of encouragement for for people in that situation oh man times are gonna be hard no matter how successful you're 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 planning to be or how successful you become things are gonna be tough there's no it's no flat smooth and easy road in life in general not even just sports and i think that's one of the things that i kept in the back of my mind also we're having a structure of just a good close-knit circle and people that kept me motivated outside of that i always thought about how my sport Sport life will correlate with my my real world life outside of track and field, right? So I always thought like, hey, if I'm so eat so quick to easily give give up in such a sport that I love, when it comes time to taking care of a family or providing and things like that, I, you can't give up on those things. When you have kids, when you have a wife, or a wife have a husband, you can't just give up. People. People have to be fed, roof have to be over, you know, roof have to be over their head. So yeah. you got to always keep that in perspective. So for me, even in those times of wanting to quit the sport because things may not have looked my way when I was injured. If I give up now, then I never know what comes after the, you know, the dark tunnel. So I just had to keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And I know from my own personal experience, and I'm sure you have as well, where it's, there are people that will, you know, take a, a, you know, cold shoulder at times and not handle their responsibilities and, and you know, not step up for, for the people that they really should. It's an awesome thing to hear, you know, you talk about that. And I did want to be able to go more into, you know, your life outside of track, because I think that that ends up being, you know, something that I think is, is a, a cool thing to be able to hear more about. I know, you know, you have obviously a rig uh, schedule and, and we could talk maybe a little bit about that too but outside track like what are some of the things that you enjoy doing and and I guess some of the causes that really are pushing you or or motivating you besides what what you're doing obviously with training and track and field oh well I mean I'm working on my I'm working on my second master's right now in theology studies that that keeps my mind flowing also with obviously gaining more knowledge in my spiritual side, learning more about scriptures as well, as well as learning how to teach them. Um, so that's a good thing to, that's like taking my mind just only off a of track. Cause sometimes I think we can overwhelm ourselves with too much thinking, too much thinking, too much thinking. And that can honestly hurt a lot of people as well, especially like if you're dealing with injuries. For me, a lot of the extra things that I was doing in my life helped me not think about my injury so because I had my mind tied to the other thing but yeah doing doing the the second masters what a lot of people you know starting to see more of on my social media is me like riding dirt bikes and stuff like that just because it, it clears my mind it keeps it keeps me at a, a very calm place to be honest my friend called it throttle therapy which I feel like most people like especially in the sport realm I feel people are so scared about what sponsors and all that stuff gonna say if it's not in your contract like I, I get the senses of people being worried about it always fall and things like that but man things can happen every day right like we can we can go as far back as, as Bryce Anello when he got shot right like I'm pretty sure he didn't think that day that was gonna happen to him you know what I'm saying anything people get 
get in car accidents, people, you know, house fires, anything. So for me to stay calm and be reserved in my sport mentally, I got to do things that brings excitement to me outside of track. So for me, I, those are two things that I balance with right now to keep me motivated still in the sport. Because with those two things, you have to continue to be motivated to progress. The things that I do on my bikes, things that I do in the, in the classwork. I'm always trying to be better in all aspects. So when I step on the track, it's that same mentality every time I go to practice. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And and you know, obviously, as a as a business owner, there's a lot of things that go into that as well. A lot of things that I can connect to with, like more so like my parents and and trying to do certain things and and taking certain risks. A lot of times it's like, oh man, you, you shouldn't do that. It might fail. You know, it might not work out. You know, or what if you do all that work and then it does? And it's like, you know, I don't want to really live my life thinking about like all the things that could happen negatively or, or all the, you know, tragedy that could happen. I want to, you know, live my life and, and try to get the most experience that I can and, and learn. And, and if something goes wrong, then it went wrong. I'll, I'll battle back. You know, it's not going to kill me. It's not, you know, as long as I'm not doing anything illegal, I'm not going to go to jail. Live in fear, man. That's the, that's the exactly. thing. live in fear too, too much in their lives. That's yeah. it. There's some people get, people die for simple things nowadays, like way simpler than the things that I'm doing. So yeah. if we should be worried about me on bikes or somebody, maybe somebody in the track world skateboarding or you know or drag racing cars on the weekend at a track man it's it's, it's smaller things that people have died or got injured from i see people we see you know older individuals who may not be in the sports they get hurt riding bicycles in the in the park and that's leisurely you think it's for a fitness situation i'm not about to stretch myself out just by mentally putting my mind into the sport but we see people do that and things don't always go with play yeah, you, know, yeah. you gotta find ways to balance that mental side yeah and, and i i feel like you, I mean, you know, it puts it all in perspective. Again, going back into the spiritual side where it's like you have a belief of abundance and, and you know, your life is much bigger than, you know, track and field or, you know, riding a bike or whatever. And instead just trying to, you know, live the best through God and, and the best life for others that, that you can, it, it puts it all in perspective. So then, you know, when you show up to run World Indoor Championship, you know, 60 Meteor, you're not nearly as in your head and the mental part of it is not as impact you right because i'm sure and, and maybe we could talk a little bit about that when you're about to go into a race like, what's going through your mind i mean is it is it very do you feel very relaxed do you feel very calm are you you know thinking about certain things that you've been maybe practicing with your technique or or what some of the mental things that you have in in your mind as you're as you're about to start uh back in the day i used to think a lot about tech stuff because i study biomechanics a lot so for me it was always just thinking about step patterns and trajectory and velocity and power at newtons i put into the ground everything i used to think about all those data analysis type deals which i feel hindered me a lot because when i said it when you start to think too much on those things you're not really truly executing compared to somebody who just be i trust the training i'm gonna just run you yeah. know and just trust that my body naturally gonna get into those positions so for me now i just started to get into that mindset of just run and let the thinking of the technical stuff happen in practice yeah. yeah i love that i know that's one of the things that obviously as a coach i'm trying to like to balance between because i know typically i I try to think about like one thing, just be able to really do that as well as I can, just to be able to, to be as, as clear as I possibly can. But obviously, you know, you, I want to be able to help people in, in being able to, to make adjustments and changes. And so it's something that I'm always constantly battling between like what's what's the best advice. And, and something I get asked a lot is, you know, what should I be thinking about running or, or starting? So. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Great perspective. Awesome to hear that. I know we, we didn't talk about, about this before, but I, I was also reading about your, you have a foundation. Do you still do the foundation where you're helping out like the scholarship for certain athletes? So I, I, so when I first turned pro, I did a scholarship for people who were going to school or wanted to go to school to have a term essay. I do stuff every year. I just don't announce it. I've never been the person that really care for the publicity, you know, yeah. so I, be, I'm just, I'm pretty much under the table with it, but yeah, yeah I, I, I probably donate anywhere between 50 to a hundred thousand a year. So uh -huh. for me, it's just always just, just trying to be smooth on the table. I don't never want to put people business out there who I'm giving the money to. So that's why people never see me post about it. And that's why so many people ask me still about it because I don't really talk about it. Like this past, this past, a lot of people don't know, and I won't put their names out there, but it was, it was, it was five after that I did that donation for that's in the pro world right now. You know, they, they need the finances and stuff like that. So I did, I did it for, I picked, I had an athletic grant where I picked five professional athletes who would sell who may not have the support and, and backing of a sponsor. And, you know, they was appreciative and I'm blessed to be able to help them. So for me, it was just, I, I don't really care 
care about the notoriety. It's all about helping people because I know what it feels like to need help. So for me, it's just staying under the books where they don't really want to put their business out there or put their name out there. Let alone, like I said, I don't really care for the word. Oh, Trey is doing this. That ain't that ain't why I do. It. Yeah, I I was reading about the one where you're talking about how you know you read something where you know basically the the person or or you were reading about how somebody was like because of your your story and your inspiration, I am not going to commit suicide tomorrow. You're just being able to have yeah uh, that that type of it of an impact and and you know I love that and and the question really goes into you know what what are you currently doing because obviously if you're if you're going into you know theology and you talked more about like teaching some of the scriptures you know what are some of the things that you're doing in in, in that regard because I could tell again even as I was reading it it was like, man it almost brought me to tears so I could tell that that ends up being something that is obviously important to you so you know is, is, is there anything that you're doing currently or, or maybe even for people in Florida that they can come in and hear you talk and and you know be able to connect with you well, at this moment, not necessarily. People know I'm always open for questions or uh, fellowship. Whenever they DM me and they want to talk about scripture, I'm always down to talk about the word of God. For me, I always feel I lead by example more than words. Uh, so even just recently, like I, I, I had celebrated a Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. I don't, I don't celebrate other worldly holidays that don't speak about it in the scriptures. So for me, I, I live by example. Like I don't, I don't celebrate Easter. I don't celebrate Christmas. I don't, you know, so when people see that and they DM me, they, oh man, why is this? Why is that? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I buy by the things that's in the word of God. And most people don't even know that the word Easter is not even a, a English word. It's a Greek word that means child, which means Passover. So what a lot of people don't realize is that the things that they're reading, they're not even taking into context. So I, I hope that by what I do and by what I represent, people start to see the truth of the scriptures. So for me, it's just staying, staying true to the word of God consistently. And when people see these things and they ask questions, I'm able to deliver God's word because, you know, it's not my word, it's his. So I just, I just try to stay focused on that. And I feel like the ministry comes through that. I love it. And is there any, I guess, particular scriptures that you really capture you or, or something that maybe connected to you really early on or, or, you know, had a big impact on you, maybe a favorite, you know, Bible verse or anything like that? Well, people see the John 330 that I got on my back. That's the one that's, that's constantly with me mentally and physically because obviously more of him less of ourselves right so it's getting people to realize that if you keep putting yourself in front of god or thinking you got the answers or thinking you got the path figured out you're gonna all fail and it goes back to what i was saying even with the scriptures like doing what the bible said and not living an opinionated lifestyle right so the scripture says that the bible is not up for private interpretations so that's why i feel like physically we have, have failed in the realm of spirituality because we try to interpret things. We have so many different formats of the Bible. I don't read the same King James version as somebody else. I read the 1611 version, which is the first transliteration of the scriptures back in the day. So everything that I'm reading is, my Bible still has the Apocrypha. So, and that was before I think they took the Apocrypha out in the 1630s or 1640s, if I can remember correctly. And my truth is in the truth of what God has led through man. And that's what the word is. He's a just God. So anybody who talked to me and talked to me about scriptures that never hear me say the word I. I never give an opinionated standpoint. I don't lead the scriptures by telling some motivational story. Everything that I preach is from the word of God. So because it's not my word, once again, it's his. So for me, it's just staying consistent, just like I'm staying consistent in my track, in my studies and whatever in life. It's the same way with the Bible. You got to stay consistent with his words. Just you stay consistent with the text. When it comes to biomechanics, these things are not something that you were making up right now. You're studying somebody else's projection of what somebody should be, where somebody should be landing on the track or what somebody should be landing on the field. You're not presenting your words and their knowledge. So the Bible is the same way. We got to stop trying to present our true but his true yeah i love that i love that and, and obviously there's there's a lot more that you've been able to you know educate yourself on in, in that regard because you know, i've been to a lot of bible studies and stuff like that and and it's a lot about going into deep interpretations about you know certain yeah verses or, or parts of the bible and and looking deep into it or trying to find meaning and, and i know there's been times where i've had a, a similar opinion where it's like, i feel like we're just looking too deep into a very simply you know you know, put sentence and, and there's no reason to try to like turn it into something that it's not. Exactly. God, God says in the Bible that 
that he's not the author of confusion, right? So if God says not to murder, there's no need to interpret that no other way. Don't kill nobody, right? So why do we find it hard to put that same structure to any other verse in the Bible? There's no, there's no reason to try to go deeper than what the word says. The word says this, that's what it says. If, he, if the Bible says be a sober mind, don't get drunk. Don't get high. Don't get so far off into thinking when you need to just be right here. It's, it's that it's that simple. But we as humans try to put our own interpretation. I'm doing air quotes on things and that's where we get lost. So that's that's the problem. The Bible is as simple as one, two, three. You just got to sit there and read. That's all you got to do. Yeah, yeah. And have this sober mind and, and really the focused mind as well. Because the more I know for me personally that I can be action oriented towards a specific goal and spend less time you know doing anything else going out to a dinner or whatever the more clear everything feels and, and we can maybe take that in, and transition into you know you're working out because sent me over the message when we were talking and, and you said you're, you're working out basically from monday through friday and correct me if i'm wrong but 10 a.m 3 p.m five hours what is it that you're you're doing within those those hours that end up being I guess very goal oriented, focus oriented. We trade all those out. Trust me. We all train right. Monday through Saturday. Monday, Wednesday, Friday are our, are our weight days, right? So okay. those in particular are the days where we're 10 to 3 from Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. We're probably in probably anywhere between 10 30 to 1 all Tuesdays and Thursdays. Saturday is a lot of quick days, like in and out, but it's a hard workout. Maybe be the, an all out 250, 200, or an all out 350, 300, all the Depends, but yeah, the work the the work is is hard. It's a it's a grind, man. It's it, it's it's not as simple as maybe other groups or even college training used to be. And what I mean by simple is that like the structure of what you do. Like with our coach and our group is he pertains every training based off the athlete. So everybody's doing something different and it's different every day. It's nothing that's just like, oh, this week is just this type of running. It's different every single day we get out there. That's why we never know what we're doing. I mean, to me, that's probably the the more effective way to do it. I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm very similar in my training where it's if there's somebody that needs to work on, let's say, ankle stiffness and another person needs to be able to work on maybe their a turnover speed you don't want them to be doing the same things. If the program shouldn't be the same, the exercise they're doing, this shouldn't be the same. Yeah, there can be some carryover there, whether I think there's some general things that everybody can benefit from. But, you know, training wise, I feel you should be as much into your specifics as, as possible. So there's a big difference between when you were started training more on the pro side and getting more into that in comparison to when you were in college. College, you were, it was a little bit more of a general type of training program. Yeah, yeah. I feel like every college is pretty like, hey, those first weeks in, say, August, September, whenever your school start training, this is the mile long runs in the grass and intramural fields, right? And then when you're getting closer to that late October, early November to December, you're working a little bit of some of the speed stuff because you're getting ready for indoors. And then obviously you work through the motions with that, with indoors, because depending on what you run and depending on the environment. And then, you know, when it starts getting a little warm, you start dropping into doing more of the time trial 250s and things like that and so on and so forth. So I felt it was a, a consistent structure across all playing fields with college, with all colleges in the, in the NCAA that, you know, the program sets up. So it is a little different than the pros where you find, you pinpoint certain things you need to fix and you consistently work on that when they get, when you're done with the, the conditioning part of the, the all season. Yeah, and, and when you guys are, are determining that, is that something that you are a part of as well? You were younger, you get you were looking a lot more into the biomechanics and the force production and, and all those different things and, and numbers and things like that. So just what I, is that something that you still, you know, have some degree of understanding what's going on or you just trust the coaches? Every coach that I, you know, I've been with, no, I've been a student of the game. So I always have input in everything that I do, no matter, no matter what level it was, since AAU to college to now, I think that's why I've had so much success in running fast is you got, you got to be able to understand the science of a lot of these things and want to be able to run, run fast. That's why I feel my ceiling and my potential is a lot higher than most because I do understand it and I know what it takes to run reach that certain level. Shoot, he's my coach. He he he'll tell you I've done things in practice that he's never seen ever in life. You know, he's been he's been getting medals at championships since he was he say twenty two. So and he the things I do in practice, man, you know, when it comes to times and stuff like that, just being able to take all that and put it in a race actually when you're dealing with competing against other people and reaction and stuff like that. So off of off of the ceiling with knowing the type of information as far as biomechanics, it makes your ceiling a lot higher because you know what it takes to get to that level. When somebody 
somebody who may just be an athlete and just like, hey, coach, whatever you tell me I'm going to do, your ceiling is only as shoot, far as your knowledge can take you. In my, in my, in my opinion, that could be obviously different. Shoot, both probably didn't care about understanding biomechanics and he mm-hmm. ran out. Uh, I love that that was your answer because the at least the top athletes that I've I've worked with have all had similar belief systems, I want to say. They want to be able to understand it. They want to be able to understand what's going on from a biomechanics perspective because I feel like it helps the training in general, right? They The, yeah. the top athletes seem to have just such a great kinesthetic awareness of their body and, and, and the, the space that it takes up and how to be able to utilize it, which is why, you know, they're able to run, run what they are. And, and maybe, you know, you're right, maybe you, Usain Bolt doesn't have a ton of understanding of it, but I'm I'm assuming for him to be able to achieve what he achieved, I mean, he had to have some pretty good understanding, and especially because of how yeah. technical track is. Yeah, uh, yeah, at least to be able to have the start that he had with how big he is, to be able to get some good understanding of how to not waste time and and how to have great reactions and things like that. So yeah, definitely, you know, and and also I think training that help helps as well. But mm-hmm. you know, anything in particular, obviously for me, I'm I'm big on the biomechanics side. Is there anything? that you did with your, you know, studying or the the things that you're, the data that you're getting that you felt was super helpful. I know I've been starting to use the the GPS stuff more to be able to track, you know, more of the the whole brand profiles, just getting more technical into to everything and just getting as much data as I can. Is there anything that you recommend or anything that you feel like really helped you out in this biomechanics? I would say the one thing I know a lot of people get into is the opposite jump. That gives a, a good amount of data from stride, limb, to uh, timing on the ground, meters per second. So it all, that, the off the jump cover a wide variety that people can take from it and input into their training from a knowledge standpoint. Be, hey, okay, if I do this, if I land here, if I push hard here, if I do this, it'll be able to put me past this limit that I had tested on the off the jump, which will put me in a better position or a better part in the race while I'm ahead or so on and so forth. Outside of that, I think it gets real expensive <laughs> when you start trying to think into more and more technology. I'm blessed to be with a company, a new balance dude put so much money into their science lab that we, we have freaking bio mech cameras set up so it can track my whole skeleton. So when I do testing up there, we can see every movement and every fiber and bone in my body. So I can see where if I felt my foot was here when it should have been here, I can actually see to the very smallest degree of where it was actually. So we talk about millions and millions of dollars worth of tech, right? So, but for me, I feel like any pro group, college, off the jump will give you enough information to help people become better. But then it comes down to actually having somebody who knows how to use it, know how to, how to explain the data. Because what people got to understand is just because a number says something doesn't always mean it's good, right? So too much height time in the air can be bad and not enough it could also be bad. Where when I tested at New Balance, I want to say one of my meters per second, I want to say like one of my step step distances was 2.9. And we talking about stride lifts, you say about a fumble leg and I'm not that tall. Yeah. But th- that may not be good for me because that might be telling me, Trey, you're too long in the air, you know? So it's stuff that where the amateur or up and comer in the pro circuit may look at that and be like, oh, God, the stride lift the bolt. They may not be good for you because if you're not a tall person that's naturally covering that distance, that probably means you're, you're in the air. Condition. Excuse me. So it's, it's being able to understand that data, understand your body and everything that comes with it. So to be able to understand how you can implement it into the into the sport. So it's just, it it takes time to really understand. No, I, I agree. When I first started the business, I, I was doing more of a, a camera system that had you know, like basic movement squats, single leg squats, balance, things like that. And the, even because I got into it, I felt so early almost, even the people that created the system didn't really know how to really effectively use the data so that was something that i i know i've been trying to figure out even to this day and i I feel like it's a lifelong journey you know something i'm very passionate about and enjoy doing where just trying to understand what do the numbers mean and how can we use it for you know the good because just depending day to day like i I did the test for instance three days in a row and got three different results so it's like how much accuracy you know because you could wake up one day you sleep a little bit different you're a little bit more stiff you know and i'm sure even you had the the situations where like you said i practice you for one ran a million amazing time achieved a million amazing things and didn't necessarily put that out on track or, or at a particular race and so you know you can't look too much into oh yeah that means that your ceiling is this or or you know you need to work on this or that or whatever which is where the data i think ends up being you know very skewed as much as i try to be as objective as as possible because 
You know, I think we all want to be able to see objective changes and, and objective results. From a diet perspective, you know, are there been any big changes that you've done with, with that in terms of, you know, things that have really helped you out? And because I, I mean, diet's obviously huge. I just want to get your perspective on that. I've always been on a strict regiment since college. Layler, they were military when it came to like, eating. So they made sure like, when we woke up, we came to the, the student hall. We had like literally a chef. So we had a specific breakfast. We always had to come to the student athletic building to get our snacks in between the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we always had our snacks in between protein shakes or drinks and stuff like that. Then come back, get lunch and, you know, go to training, this, this, that. Then come back probably for dinner right before you go to study all. So we always had on a strict, a strict diet when it came to, to performing. And that just followed me up until my pros so in the same way, where it's, hey, you a good breakfast. I always bring a snack with me. I have a quick lunch in, before, in between weight. After that, I have a good, you know, and a nice dinner. So I stay consistent on that. Well, you know, yeah, you lean meats, your fish, your rice. I always have multiple greens more than anything on my plate. So it's just being smart about what your body needs. I say you are you're a car, right? You're a well machine car. You ain't gonna put bad gas in a Ferrari. So for me, it's all about making sure you put the right things down. Even now, I'm trying to get yeast out of all my food, out of all the foods that I eat. So watching the bread, watching even like the snack. A lot of people don't know like candy, potato chips, all that stuff got just in it. And it's just clogging up the body. So, you know, you gotta just be aware of all those type of things. The more that I've gotten into, you know, high performance performance and, and the, the training behind it, I feel like more that I realized that similar with training, I think that there's a lot of things that, that you can take away with within your body when it comes to how your body works and the blood work and, and things like that. You can get tested on it and, and be able to figure out like, are you high in magnesium or low in, in you know, iron and, and all of those levels to try to make it as you know, good as possible. So I didn't know if there was anything maybe that you've been able to find out through there. I've done it before, like in the past, but I'm very, I'm very stuff does swear way too far for me if i am human if it's a nba finals or something going on like i may ask but even then i've had friends and athletes come eat with me and we'll be at buffalo wild wings and they make it 15 20 wings i get like five but like even then i don't I, I'm, I'm consistent man I, i've trained my family to only eat certain things that's great and then, you know, this is something that has been talked about a lot recently, and, and I'd love to hear your take on it, is like, there's there's been some, I guess, negative news. I guess there wasn't as many people that showed up for the world championships, and there's like some things about viewership going down with track and field. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm some somebody that's very uh, big fan of wanting to be able to have ways to improve, you know, track and field in general, and, and really sprinting in, in particular, because, you know, I feel like the, the sprinters end up not being as well represented as they should be there's so many people that i feel are fast in you know the united states as well as the world and i mean is there anything that you feel like that that could be done within track and field to be able to, to improve viewership we have to and i know a lot of people don't like think too much on it because of the historic sense of it but for our sport to become bigger we must separate and deviate from one another i truly feel that the eyes to sport get lost in how long competitions are especially if people are trying to see just certain things everybody don't just want to sit there and watch a whole four hour track meet of just constant 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 running right we even see that at track meet like in person somebody may want to watch the 100 that they're going to get some food during the 15 it's, it's just a long event that a lot of people don't but if you separate it but still keep the team aspect when it comes towards worlds or olympics i think we can we can progress in the way that we all could benefit from so imagine if track and field take the senses of the boxing right if we may if we take the 100 meters away from the track and field sense of the body of it and say hey, we're going to make a only sprint series or only jump series or all the throw series with constant competition then the people who love those events and watch those events they can they can follow and, and tune into those and they can market it better and you can market it at a more higher level uh especially for the excitement of head-to-head -head competition or even implement say like gambling and those type of things but even if you imagine track and field with the 100 meters if you make it a boxing where you have under cars then the main cars like, you can make that event so big where you know let's say you take right now with old marcel and fred stuff you have them two you got me and noah you got marvin and somebody else just have those cards one of it built up so yeah it could still be say a two two hour event but it can be where it's, oh we watch these two people race have an intermission people mix and mingle you know whatever then next and then they, all the way up to the big main card where hey people are 
excited to watch speed. Me personally, I feel 100 meters could live on its own without the whole body of track and field throughout a year is what I mean. Not as far as just taking it out of the sport because track and field is what it is. Yeah. But if you made a print series just of the 100 meters, man, when I tell you the pay, the watch, the viewers will go up on their own because people love to see speed. But I also believe people to see things like jumps and throws as well. How do I know this? Look at America Ninja Warriors and all that. So people love to see the strongest man or how far somebody can throw something. Like people love those type of things, but they're not trying to dip and dive through channels or web websites to try to just find this viewing. But once again, it's because the event is so, it's such a large event, but it's such a long event that they don't market it well. And it's, it's just at the bottom of the barrel. So me personally, I think we still keep a world championship at the end of at the end of the year. That and I think that needs to be the last race. I think world championship should be every single year. I think Olympics can still be every four years, but not emphasize those two events being the greatest events to track and field. Like NBA Finals, Super Bowl, those they're those are the big events for those sports. Basketball, yeah, they can go to the Olympics. I can tell you right now, basketball players don't care about those. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's just a it's just a symbol or status for them to just say I have an Olympic medal but they don't they're not getting no money from that they get money from being the NBA finals champion or NBA finals MVP we don't have that in our sport so all the defining factors go to two events one that don't even happen every year two the one don't even happen for every four years so we put ourselves in a deficit when we do that that's why I think it needs to be a series like let the 100 meter runners make their own money on their own circuit let the 200 runners make their own money on their own circuit so on and so forth with every event I'm not saying distance won't make no money how do I know this because distance runners are the reason that shoe companies make money more people in the world can correlate with distance runners because people just go jogging in the park how many people you know wake up every day and be like hey man I'm about to go get in track spikes and just go sprint yeah. you don't see that so let the 100 meter runners be more inside of a boxing format and let the distance runners be more in a role racing or marathon so on and so forth format so both parties can be favored by a certain audience more money is involved it'll be easier to market because it's less household of events and still keep the world world and olympics but just doesn't don't make it the hierarchy of the sport because when you do that then that leaves people just be like oh, i'm gonna just watch track and field when i let them come. yeah because i can't tell you how many people ask me on a day-to-day -day basis how do you make money so we don't even have a showing for it it's just Oh, well, the people ask me straight up, it'll be three years from the Olympics. They, are you going to the Olympics? They don't even know that you have to try out for it. People don't know this stuff because it's, it's not even talked about because we make it the only thing. So they're just expecting, hey, if you're the fastest man, I'm expecting that you're going to be at the Olympics. The Olympics ain't even until another three years and you still have to make a team. But they don't know that. We're doing a lot of things backwards when it comes to marketing and figure out how to bring more eyes to the sport. The thing that I feel like missing as well is just the hype behind it. It would be awesome to be able to have, you know, even going into the world championships or the Olympics, you, Frank Curley, Noah Lyles, like Christian Coleman, like and people just, you know, being able to ask you guys questions or even if like you said, get into a one on one type of a format, you can create cut some of that like controversy or or you know, have the, the questions start to get into more of the, the hype behind it. So then you're gonna get more viewership. Cause I know when everything was happening with the world championship, it was like hard to find and there's times where like, they weren't even playing the world championships on like NBC and some random show instead of the world championships the times would be between two to five there's going to be the 1500 the 3000 the 100 meter they didn't even tell you what times it was going to actually be just like between this time period all these things are going to happen and this is for a viewer perspective it's terrible you have no idea when all those are going to happen we don't really get to get that same type of connection what makes it so you know so many people i think tune into boxing is you start to build that connection within some of these big you know fighters and you know makes you want to watch and you can't run from the competition that's why i feel especially the 100 meters needs to go boxing format because they and then we just say hypothetical right we say red has the belt right now for world fastest man and just like boxing you have a year if you don't fight in a year you have to give your title up you have to give it up so that makes people have to race and say as if he, he can you know when you go for a title when you have a title belt you can pick and choose a fight you have to fight somebody for the title belt and that that also makes a statement for individuals who may not have the name as the higher higher athletes in the sport 
but that's how you build through the ranks, right? Say, imagine, say if I'm coming up, say a Fred, number one, right, for the world title belt, and I'm coming up through the ranks, or I, or I ain't even gonna say myself, say like Michael Williams from Oregon, right? He's coming up through the ranks, and he's beating everybody, everybody, top dog after top dog after top dog. I want the title belt. You can't deny me. And then when he comes out and make a statement like that, the world is gonna get behind. He done ran through all the other big names. Now to race him now, Fred, for the belt. That builds the hype because then if you don't, if you don't battle for the title belt, now I can talk trash. I can, yeah. oh, you scared to race me? You scared to race for the title? Just, and it's going to build so much hype, so much money behind it, and people are going to want to see it. But because we don't have that structure, it's, it, it allows people not to race, and then it's just everything is down to just one race. And that's out of a world championship or Olympics which still doesn't define really anything. Because some people argue and say, oh, Marcel's the Olympic champ, so he's the fastest. Fred is the world champ, so he's the fastest. Nobody really knows. Yeah. Then you got people who may run faster times than both of them, and they can't deny that. I didn't, you know, I didn't win in Tokyo, but everybody, people will say, oh, well, Trey ran the fastest time, so he's the fast. But I didn't win the title, so that don't define me as the fact. It's, it's such a, a confused situation where in other sports, it is known by a certain circumstance. And it's not like that for our sport because we have so many different titles to go for. We got the Olympics, we got the World, we got the Diamond League, we got all these different things that will find somebody for being fast, so nobody really truly knows. Where in boxing, it's a belt. The NBA Finals, it's the Finals. Super Bowl is the Super Bowl. We have too much things that define too many other objects and nobody really knows. So that's why nobody really hates it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and again, you know, it's, you know, something that, that I feel we should, we can talk more about, you know, definitely because I, I feel very passionate about it as well, where I mean, hundred meter, 200 meter, potentially even the 60, if you want to get to the indoor, right. Those races, I feel like they definitely have their own maybe season to it or something that much more, you know, defined for the athlete to make it. So, cause, cause, you know, I mean, for the longer distance stuff, I feel you need to have a little bit more of a break in between for like for running the hundred. Like you, you don't need to have a, a huge break. You could do that, you know, every week or or have a, a six week, you know, change up the training where you get you could have a six week time period where you're having you know races pretty pretty frequently with some of the best guys. And I, and I feel that would add so much value to everybody within the sport. And instead of making it so some of the guys that are coming up would be able to get much more nor notoriety, and then would just make it so you know even if you do like 32 guys and you guys are just like battling it out and, and create a format like that over the course of, of a few weeks you know if there'd be so much hype behind that it would be it would be an awesome thing to be able to watch and, and i think it would do a lot for the sport oh yeah definitely so yeah i mean with that being said i mean any any final thoughts anything else that you want to i guess you know say to say to anybody that's watching to be able to maybe help them out or or you know anything man just stay focused i think that's the key key to life man stay focused stay stay prayed up have faith and just just remember things things get better especially when you stay positive it's easy to get down it takes more energy to frown it takes in it take more energy to stay down so pick yourself up stay strong keep moving through the motions things will get better especially if you have that positive mindset you got to keep your eye on the prize with everything that you do i love it that's awesome i appreciate you you doing this and and you know taking the time if anybody wants to reach out to you you know after watching this or anything like that is, is their best way to be able to, to get in contact with you definitely instagram i check i check my best requests here and there so i usually i usually probably check them once a week so i just to see if anybody will reach out have any questions anything like that so if they want to hit me up and talk to me about anything yeah they just hit me up in, in the message of course all right awesome thanks again thank you again for for doing this